you know, my main problem with Jared is very simple, and it and it uh, boiled over. I write about it in my book. It boiled over in this oh in this meeting in Jared's office in the summer of 2019. And I walked in. It was he called the meeting. It was Jared, Brad Parscale, Ronna McDaniel, the head of the RNC, still is, and Mick Mulvaney, then chief of staff. And it boiled over where Jared said, oh, I had no idea how much you hated me, Kelly. And I said, Jared, I don't hate you. Don't flatter yourself. I don't understand you. We're three plus years into this. The president wants us to work together. And all you do is try to get get in my way. You roll your eyes. You roll me. The president says, work together on this, the two of you. And you give him a very flippant shore. And then you tell people I'm a leaker. Of course, he had people on the government payroll who were leaking left and right. So that's just some of the sparring back and forth that you write about in your book. Jared uh, Kushner, I have negotiated with him successfully when uh, former senior advisor to President Trump, his book, Breaking History, is there. So, uh, of course, Kellyanne came out with a book last month. So you guys didn't didn't see eye to eye in a few things. Do you remember the situation? Yeah, so so we really didn't work that closely together. You know, we she was on the campaign for the last uh, couple months, and and she did a very good job with the communication. She was on television uh, all the time, and, and did really really strong. Everybody else that. was jumping ship. She she stayed. Well, she was a little shaky during that time, but she she got to the right place. But but uh, but again, she did a good job advocating for the president on television. Uh, and uh, then we got to the White House. It was about getting things done, and I was more kind of working on policies and getting things done. And she was in the communication. So she really doesn't show up much in my book because again, I was working on Middle East peace. I was working on securing the border, uh, building the wall. I was working on, uh, you know, Operation Warp Speed. I was working on prison reform. And I think she was working on other things. So again, I, I had no problems with her. I just tried to avoid a little bit because she did a lot of uh, interacting with the media. And I think she had different things she was working on. And I had my own things I was working on. And a guy that you did not see eye to eye with who, who was an infighter is Steve Bannon, who didn't last long. And when he left the White House, he quickly combined with another book to really hit the president pretty hard when he left. What was that like, being that you left the business world and then you suddenly had to deal in the White House with Steve Bannon at that time, Reince Priebus, who seemed to combine against you? So Steve actually was a phenomenal ally on the campaign. He was very, very helpful uh, with the campaign. When He's he extremely joined. smart. Yeah, he, he, he's a, he, he was, again, like I said, he was a great partner on the campaign. And then when we got to the White House, I don't know why he 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 started going after me. I write a scene uh, where I think you know I tried to mediate between him and Gary Cohn uh, because they were leaking on each other, and he basically said I'm going to break you in half. And maybe he thought I was siding with them over him, but I think we agreed on a lot of the policies. We agreed on securing the border. We agreed on uh, more protectionist trade policy, uh, and uh, we agreed on the deregulation. But all of a sudden, I felt like I was getting leaked on all over the place, and I was very out of my element. I'd never been in Washington. I I, I didn't talk to the press at all. Like, how did I get here? <laughs> and and, and I, I basically had an inflection point. I write about this where I said, okay, you know, if I have to fight back, and and I I can either try to leak back at him, or I could do my game. And I kind of said, look, I can never out leak a leaker. Like, I'm, if your heart's not in it and you're not good at it, you're never going to beat somebody who's good at it. And so I basically said, look, the the only way that I can I can sustain is I have to get tighter. Uh, just focus on getting things done, and that's the best way to do it. So I played the long game, and ultimately, what I what I found with my uh, my opponents that I write about in the book is that I actually never defeated them. What happened was is I was able to kind of create a foundation for myself where I can focus on getting my things done. And often they blew themselves up, which is what happened with Steve. And so, look, I, I wish him well. He was I, I supported his pardon at the end. He was there uh, for us in in the first campaign when very few people were. Um, and, you know, I wish him nothing but the best. Right. Saying he's back with the president. He's back tight with the president, it seems. Uh, again, I, I, you never know what the perception is and, and what's actually happening. But he's definitely become a very strong voice uh, for MAGA. But one thing I will say, too, like he, he's very big into the, the R&R, Republican on Republican Civil War stuff. And that was his thing at Breitbart. And, and I think that fighting the establishment was a good thing. But when you're governing, right. uh, what I saw is that the parties are not ubiquitous, right? They're basically collections of tribes. And if you want to pass legislation and get things done, you need to figure out how to unite the tribes and get people together. And, and maybe that's why he wasn't the best uh, influence when he was in the White House. Uh, and also some of the other battles. Mick Mulvaney had a rival and it was uh, Pat Cipollone, mm-hmm. correct? You had the referee between them. I had no idea that they weren't getting along, but it was a pretty critical time because right after you get done with the Russia investigation, you got the impeachment and you realize these guys got to find a way uh, and you had to get involved in that again. Yeah. So that was during what I call season three, right? My third year there, we had different staff and I, I, I saw so many people come and go that, you know, I kept trying to you adjust. You like both. And, 
I actually got along very well with both. I thought they both had their strengths. But I was in this like weird scene where Mick would come into my office and complain about Pat, how Pat was leaking on him. Then Pat would come to my office and complain about how Mick was leaking on him. And I was like, guys, like the president has a pretty existential threat here, which is they're trying to impeach him. The good news is – and by the way, this this happened with Russia. This happened with the Ukraine. Is like the Democrats would constantly pick the worst things to go after. And I would always joke with Trump on, on the Russia things. I'd say, look, the good news is, is they're going after you on probably the thing that you're most innocent of of anything you've ever been accused of, right? <laughs> so the impeachment, they, they chose a stupid thing to try to impeach him on. And so we said, let's make him pay a political price. But – you have to make sure you have the right legal strategy, the right communication strategy, and it doesn't work when the chief of staff and the chief legal counsel are fighting with each other. And so for me, after my kind of first year, I tried to really stay in my lane a lot more and say, you know, everyone was criticizing me for getting involved. And by the way, probably rightly so, right? I, I viewed it as a business guy. There's a problem. You have to get involved and try to fix it. But the more I tried to fix other people's problems, the more they would start leaking on me and resenting I was involved. So I kind of, kind of got tighter and I saw here that this was an existential threat for the president with the impeachment. I had to get involved. I tried working with both. It really wasn't working. So I, I created a separate comms team uh, mm -hmm. to come in. I, I read actually a bunch of books on it and and I saw how uh, Panetta did it for Clinton. And Panetta was, I think, probably one of the top two chiefs of staff that I studied uh, when I was in there. And he basically brought in uh, a, a lawyer named Shelburne who, who, who reported – um, directly, and, and they basically created a pod that was able to fight the impeachment. We brought in this guy, Tony Sagi, who was phenomenal. Um, you know, Hogan, you know, Gidley came in, was phenomenal. Uh, Pam Bondi, the right. lawyers, and we just pummeled them. And, and from start of impeachment to end, President Trump's approval rating went up 10 points. Right. And then you had the one at the end uh, before you left, and now you have a, a mini one now with uh, the raid with the January 6th investigation, and now you have the raid uh, on Mar-a-Lago, where it stands right now. Um, have you thought about what more you could have got done had you not had the Ukrainian phone call, had you not had the phony Russia investigation? So I, I think the biggest impediment was COVID, right? By, by, by year three, we'd actually gotten pretty good at it and we were used to it operating in a very hostile, combative environment. And I think Trump had finally figured out how to move all the levers of power. We had great people in all the different areas. Uh, the deregulation was happening amazingly. Again, the year before Trump was elected, there were 6 million man hours in America spent uh, complying with new regulations. And then for four years, you had the first four years in our history where there was a net decrease in our country in the cost of regulations, which helped small businesses. It's all coming back yeah, now. Yeah, which, which they're putting back, which is crazy. But but but, but, but bottom line is I think COVID held us back. Uh, we, we were very close to the Middle East. I mean, we really had six peace deals. We had great momentum. I think we could have gone six more uh, at least. And, um, and, and I think the other thing that I, I really wish we would have made more progress on was – uh, was was immigration. We, we developed a, a merit-based immigration system. I got called in uh, after year two. Again, I write about this in the book where Trump does the shutdown. I just got my criminal justice reform done that I worked so hard on. I write about how that almost the died. Jeff Sessions tried to stop you every step of the way. A lot of people. Jeff Sessions, McConnell, again. And by the way, the Democrats too. John Lewis tried to stop it. I mean, we, we, we worked through and it was really like standing on a ball and navigating. We got it done. Incredible. 87 votes in the Senate with an asterisk because I think Burr voted against it because he was pissed at Tim Scott on something and Lindsey Graham was in Afghanistan. So we would have had 89, but I'm not bitter about that. Um, but but so we get that done and Trump calls me in a couple hours later and says, why aren't you working on immigration? I said, well, Kelly told me not to work. He said, well, look, I'm here for two years and I don't have a wall. You know, Kelly's failed me. Bannon's failed me. Nobody's gotten me the wall. Paul Ryan. You know, Paul Ryan. He says, congratulations, you're in charge of the wall. I said, okay. So so I worked actually with, with Mick, did a great job, and uh, Cipollone did a great job. You repurposed defense spending. If they wouldn't give you more point one point four or 1.8, you repurposed defense spending in order to build the wall. Well, we used, uh, we found a lot of different change under couch cushions and within the federal government. And, uh, and actually, Stephen Miller was very helpful. And, and we, we spent, um, we, we got... Uh, 470 miles done by the end, and we had another 300 miles, which would have really secured it um, that that the Biden administration scrapped. So, but, that but we paid for already. Uh, we paid for everything. So but, it's paid for to rust in the desert right now. I guess that's their policy. I don't understand it. And by the way, border. When I coming from New York, people said the border is xenophobic. It's racist. It is a very common sense thing. It's a physical barrier to protect your sovereignty and to allow border patrol agents to have more utilization. And but the one that I also regret was we developed an amazing merit based immigration system, which you know Trump referred to as the big beautiful door, where he wanted to welcome people to the country, but he wanted them to come legally. And you want people who are going to grow your GDP grow your wages, not depress wages. And we really developed an amazing system that I think would have actually been phenomenal for, for our country. And I really hope one day it gets implemented. Yeah, so do I. Anthony Fauci said this yesterday on our channel about Cut18.
Do you regret the shutdown, the sweeping shutdown that some yeah. said made things worse? No, I, I, I don't, uh, Neil. And in fact, I think we need to make sure that your listeners understand I didn't shut down anything. There was a lot of consideration among the White House task force that we were reaching a point where the hospitals, such as in New York City and other places, were being strained to the point of practically being overwhelmed. Can you bring us inside those meetings? What, what was he pushing you guys to do? So, so first of all, he's master with words and on being on all sides of things. But, but I'd say in the beginning, the first 15 days that we did to stop, stop the spread, that, that made a very big difference, right? The, hot, the, 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 the rate of growth and spread of the virus was, was huge. The hospitals were running out of capacity. And we did not have enough medical supplies in the country to deal with it. So but by doing the first 15 days where we got people to kind of stay in place a little bit more, that enabled us to, to, to stimulate supplies. And again, I go through this in the book, how we did it. We were facing improbable challenges. We got all the bureaucrats out of the way and we brought private sector and the military in. And we just made miracle after miracle after miracle happen in order to get the supplies we needed uh, to different places. And I write about how we did it, but it was very, very improbable, those things. After that, it became, um, I, I think, the media weaponized COVID uh, against Trump in a very aggressive way. Right? Well, do you think he did, too? Because he had a lot of friends in the media. You had, you had Governor Cuomo says, I was going, to, I was backdooring the administration with Fauci. He, he spent an awful lot of time talking with the media. Again, he was in my office once. His phone rings. It you know, shows up Jim Acosta. I wrote about this. And it's like, come on, man. Like, we're supposed to all be on the same team. And this is a pandemic. Let's put our jerseys aside and let's focus on going. And, and the thing that frustrated a lot of people, too, was that, you know, he was – you know, one of the nation's foremost experts. I use experts, you know, in quotes because I think you have a lot of experts in government who, uh, who, who, quite frankly, you know, shouldn't be there. Um, but he's an expert. He's been in the task force. We're scaling the testing as quickly as possible, right? And, and I always say when you have a problem, there's three different things that that can constrain you. It's either imagination, it's money, or it's gravity. Here, we had an amazing plan which we developed very quickly. We had unlimited capital to spend to 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 stimulate it, but we had to make Q-tips, right? And, and basically, we just didn't have enough Q-tips in this country. And I found that it was always the lowest cost wow. item that becomes your biggest bottleneck. And so we we did DPAs. We were working with American Cotton. We were flying them in from all over the world. But everyone in the world was looking for the same product. So we're scaling as quickly as we can. You need to make the reagents. You need to make the 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 the, the, gotcha. the transfer media. And, and so we're scaling it all up. We figured out miracles to do it. And he goes on television and instead of saying what we're doing, this is what we're doing, this is where we are today, it's faster than anyone in the world, he says, we're just not there yet. I'm saying, what is this guy, a sportscaster? <laughs> like, you know, he's literally in the meeting. He's on the task force. He was there even before me. I came in to try to clean up the problem that they left. And and, and it's just, it would have been much You don't need an analyst. You need an advocate that was telling the truth behind the scenes that could express to the American people Just to explain to them what the problem was why we were where we were and what we were doing to fix it and why pe what people could do best to get there. So I, I think COVID became very political, very emotional for a lot of people. But again, I, I think that, you know, Operation Warp Speed that we did in, in this book, which again, you know, he said couldn't be done in a year and a half. Um, we ended up getting a vaccine, the fastest vaccine in history, because President Trump came in and said, get it done. We hired the right people. We, we cut all the bureaucracy out. And The Lancet just published a study that said that that saved 20 million lives. Well, look, I, I, that's all true. And I know when the president says it, he gets – when he goes – brings up the vaccines, he says, why are people booing me at these events when I bring up the vaccine? I know the answer. It's the mandate. So if you tell the people, take the vaccine, it works, I'll show you the study, it's still my decision. When you tell us, take the vaccine or you're fired, take the vaccine or you're not allowed in, that's when the American people just can't get their head around it. Some – overreact and get two masks and five vaccines and six boosters and others don't. Do you agree with that? A, a thousand percent. We, we were never for vaccines. We never imposed. Uh, we were never for mandates. We never imposed mandates. But I do think that the vaccine w was a miracle. I think it was it was safe, at least the first iteration. I thought it was very effective, uh, historically effective. Right. Uh, but it should definitely be up to people whether they, they choose to use and it. And you have not. to admit to people that it's a variant now. Uh, the vaccine is not going to be as effective as a variant, so we're worried about – so the minute you start telling it's going to work anyway and they get it and they get it two or three times, Anthony Fauci got it, the president got it, everyone's getting it. That's when I think credibility got lost and, and politics dug in. So lastly, uh, Jared, in writing this book, what did the president say? Did he read all of it? Did he did you summarize it for him? Were you worried about him reading it? So, so I didn't show it to him beforehand because I really wanted it to be my story. Um, but I, I do think that I 
was able to show people a lot of very intimate moments. I, I think that people are always speculating on what Trump is like. And I always say the truth is hiding in plain sight. But what I wanted people to say, and another criticism people give of him is they'll say, okay, I love his policies, but I wish he would be act like a normal person. Well, I always say if he acted like a normal person, A, he probably wouldn't have been president. And I think that he probably wouldn't have been as successful as president if he was. So what I want people to do in this book is, is read it and then really judge for themselves how Trump used his unique personality and his unique outsider approach to take on a Washington that was very hostile, that I think our founding fathers designed a great system, but it needed a shock to the system. He was that shock. And I think he got better and better at it as he went. And what he said to me when I gave it to him is he said, look, this is a very important book. I'm glad that uh, that somebody wrote a book that's really going to talk about what actually happened in the room. And he says, I'm going to read it. So, and he, and he started yeah. reading it and he's given me some compliments on it so far. And um, and again, I I hope he's proud of it. I don't know if he'll like anything. You, you guys couldn't Everything. be more different, but you respect how different both of you are with each other, and is that that comes across clearly how he oh. feels about you and the job he gave you. Thank you. And I, I always right. noticed that there was only one of us that was elected. It was him. And so <laughs> if I disagreed, I was grateful that he gave me the opportunity to do it. But I was an advisor. Sometimes he listened. Sometimes he didn't. But we had a lot of fun. Breaking history, the name of the book, Jared Kushner. Thanks so much for the quality time. Great. Thank you so much, Brian. Great to be with you. Hi, everyone. I'm Brian Kilmeade. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to click to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page. This is the only way that I know for sure that you're not going to miss any great commentary, any great news bites, any great interviews coming your way on Fox. You can get it all here on YouTube. So subscribe right now.